This morning we're, uh, is going to be, uh, we're going to conclude home improvement. We've been going through the series on home improvement uh, for the past several months. And uh, obviously we've been going through this entire uh, series. And, you know, some may wonder, you know, like why, you know, we're spending so much time studying a subject like this. Because I think the reasons are clear that in the beginning, God established a family as, as the, the basis, as the first of all human relationships. And then from that, God built society, and you know what? Nothing has changed. The family is still foundational, you know, it's still a foundational family, uh, unit of the family. But think about this. No church, no community, or nation is stronger than the families that make it up. If your family, if the families, you know, in the community are falling apart, and, and try, that's how that community is going to be. That community is going to be, that nation is going to be that way. And so this morning, we want to build strong families. We want to build strong homes. Amen? So if you have your Bible, Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 1, and we're going to go through verse 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, But uh, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I pray that as we go through your word and that we finally, you know, we take these principles and we would apply it to our life. Lord, that these are not something that we just say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to accept this or this or this, but I'm not going to do that. But Lord, we would say, you know what, this is your word and I'm going to follow what your word says. That we don't pick and choose. And Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit this morning. Lord, give us ears to hear and a heart that is willing to do what your word says. In Jesus' name, amen. And since we've been talking about families, obviously we know that it's very important. And so what we need to realize is that we probably need to redouble our efforts on everything that we, you know, we've been doing. Some people say, well, you know, I don't have any kids in the house anymore. I don't have this or this. I don't have any. And, you know, but hopefully we sit there and say, you know what? Even though that we have no, maybe no kids in the house you know, anymore or anything else, but we still sit there and say, you know what? You're still parents. You're still grandparents. You're still an aunt and an uncle. And you know what? Kids need to know, you know, that there's an authority figure, right? That they need to know how to treat, you know, an authority figure. That they need, they need to realize that, that, for one thing, that it's a God-given obligation that we love one another and submit to one another for the glory of God, right? That how we treat other people, that how parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, how, however it is, however we treat people, is what our kids are going to see how they should treat people, right? And some of us, you know, don't like that because the fact is, is that we don't necessarily like how we treat people. And then we're like, okay, then I don't like the way that my kid's treating people. Well, sometimes we need to look at the mirror and say, you know what, maybe my kid is acting this way is because I'm acting that way. And I want to, I want to preface this right at the beginning. This sermon, and this is not me trying to cop out of this, all right? I'm, I'm telling you that most of this sermon is not my stuff. Is not my material. I, I, I read it, and, and, and I, you know, I went through it, and I said, you know what? This is something that needs to be preached. Yes, there are, part, you know, the, you know, there are parts of this, but a lot of this is not my stuff. This is from another pastor. I'm just telling you right at the beginning. And it, you know, to me, when I was going through this and reading this, and, and you know, I knew that God wanted me to, you know, to preach this, it was hitting me. You know, it, it was hitting me you know, right in the heart because it was areas that I saw in my own life that you know, I'm like, you know what? I need to be better in that area. Okay? And I'm just being honest with you, you know, this morning is the fact that I realize that there are areas in my life, you know, because I think so many times we get to the point where like, you know what, I'm the parent, you're the kid, you're going to listen to whatever I say no matter what. Right? And they were like, that's how it is, because I said so. <laughs> right? But, the, you know, and obviously we've, we've looked at the areas of the Bible that teach us about the marriage relationship, t- taught us about the respective roles of, of men and women, Told, you know, we even looked at the problem of the prodigal children because you know what? You can try and train your child in the ways of the Lord, but we know that every child, every person has a will. They have a free will, and they can accept it or not. But that doesn't mean we get out, you know, it's not like a get out of jail free card and be like, oh, sorry, there's a strong willed child, or I'm sorry, this, whatever. I can't do anything about it. No, we are to do everything in our power to try and teach them about the Lord and to show them, you know, the ways of the Lord. And if they reject it, I'm not saying like, you know, like, oh, okay, whatever, you know, well, they're out of the house now. I don't have to do anything. No, we still are trying to teach them no matter what we're doing because we want them to hopefully one day realize maybe I was, you know, they're like, I was wrong. 
For me, it, it, it took me getting out of my house, you know, of being old enough to get out of my house to realize that a lot of my, and my, my parents weren't believers, okay? But I realized that my parents, that when they would discipline me or they would do something or whatever, that it was actually for my own good. Because let's face it, as kids and stuff, uh, you know, when you're a kid, teenager, you know everything, don't you? And I say, I'm not saying that, you know, yes, it, it sounds kind of funny, but as a, as a teenager, I was like, yeah, Dad, I know that. Mom, you don't, you don't know what you're talking I know what I'm talking about. I was in my early 20s, you know, when I began to sit there and go, and, and, and I realized it, and it dawned on me. Of course, at this time, I was a believer, and I went back to my parents, and I said, I am sorry that I was a know-it-all, that I told you that I knew everything, that, you know, uh, you know, that I didn't need your help or whatever. I am so thankful that you tried to teach me in spite of my rebellious you know, ways towards you. And, and so, you know, when I share these things this morning, it's the fact that, you know, it's, it's coming from my experience, but it's also coming from the fact, like I said, of, this, of, this, uh, the, of the pastor that um, wrote this, you know, so well. And so this morning, what we're going to do is that we're going to look at um, we're going to consider the dual messages, you know, that God offers as I preach a message, I, you know, that I entitled, or that is entitled, Growing Up Together. Growing Up Together. And I know it sounds strange. You're like, Pastor, what do you mean growing up together? Well, you know, when you have kids, you were not a parent before that, right? But when you have kids, you're, you grow up, you know, as they grow up, you grow up into a parent. They grow up into, you know, hopefully God-fearing adults, Right? And that's what we want to do. We're growing up together. So number one is this. There is a message for the learners. There's a message for the learners. And so if you look at uh, verse, uh, verses 1 through 3 again, where it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first command, uh, commandment with a promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. So number one is, that, uh, you know, like I said, uh, so the first thing we see here is that there is a clear word. There's a clear word. Up to this point, like I said in this series, we have, you know, we have pretty much neglected the role of children in the family. All the kids are like, uh-oh. Because this one, you know, the, uh, uh, this, this message is going to deal with children in the family. And so that means that you know, kids should be listening this morning. And this passage, however, you know, has a very clear word in this uh, you know, for children and young people. It speaks about your actions. What does it say? It says, children are told to do what? Obey their parents. Right? I mean, it says, obey your parents in the Lord, right? It doesn't, I mean, there's no, like, little, like, little subsection in there, like, well, it technically means this. There's no, like, uh, you know, there's no fine print. It says, obey your parents, right? It says, and, you know, this word, you know, that word obey literally means, like, to submit to, to comply with, to heed, to follow, and so, uh, you know, to, to follow instructions, you know, or directions. Now, usually what happens, you know, uh, you know, with children is they hear something, they know they're supposed to obey it, but they're the best lawyers that are out there because they will try to find, you know, that fine print. But in other words, you know, it, it literally means to hear under. It is a command. It's not a suggestion. When it says, you know, that we are to give heed, you know, that we are to obey your parents, it means that you are to do it, right? And this means that a child is to listen to the voice of his or her parents attentively. What does that mean? That you're not, like, looking at the TV when you do it. It's not you going like this, yeah, mom, yeah, dad. It's not doing that, right? It's to listen attentively. Like, you're listening, you say, okay, I got it. I, I understand what you're saying. And that they are to respond to what they hear with what? Perfect submission. Meaning that when they do it, it's, yes, I'm going to go ahead and do it. This is what they're to, to do. Because I see some you know, people out there kind of like shaking their head. No, I'm saying this is what they're supposed to do. Does it happen all the time? No. They're to do as they are told, Right? It doesn't change the fact that kids are supposed to do as they're told. Obedience in the home is the very foundation for, uh, for obedience throughout life. If your kids are, are not wanting to obey you, they're not going to want to obey other authority figures. I mean, think about this, that in everything in, in God's universe can be boiled down to obedience, right? The planets, the stars, the seas, the, the animal kingdom all operate in strict obedience to the commandments of the Lord. 
Whatever the Lord has told them to do, they do. The earth spins on its axis. Why? Because the Lord tells it to do that. The stars move. Why? Because the Lord tells them to do that. You know, the animals, you know, how does a dog know how to, you know, like that it hates cats? Because the Lord told it to. I mean, think about those things. That everything in, you know, that God has created is in strict obedience to the commands of God. And you know what? Humanity is the only part of God's creation that walks in rebellion to the revealed word of God. Man he rebelled against. That's the only part of creation. And because of that, what we see, this world is not how it actually should be. I talked about this before. It's going to be amazing. Like, I sit there and think about the majesty of the mountains. I go, man, that's awesome. You know, or, or see a beautiful sunset, you know, uh, out here, and I go, man, that's amazing. And to realize that that's nothing compared to what God had originally intended and what he's going to do to restore it when we're all with him, right? Amen. As children learn to obey their parents, because kids don't come out, they don't come out, you know, you know come out as babies, and instantly they want to obey mom and dad, right? They're, you know, but the thing is, is that, like I said, it's setting the stage for obedience throughout their life, that they are learning to respect authority, that they are learning to obey the, uh, the other voices of authority in school, in government, their parents, that will become of their lives, you become part of their lives later on. So ultimately, the children are learning to walk in obedience to the Lord when they walk in obedience to their parents. If a kid won't obey their parents, they're not going to obey the Lord. If their kids don't obey, obey the Lord, they're not going to obey teachers. They're not going to obey police officers. They're not going to obey those that are in authority over them, are they? It all starts at home. He also speaks about your, uh, about your attitudes. Children are also told to honor their parents. The word honor, obviously, you know, uh, the word honor means to respect, to revere, to hold in high regard, to fix the value that when they see their parents, they know that that person's important, that they respect them, that they revere them, right? It spe uh, this speaks about a child's attitude towards what his parents tell them to do. Now, a child may obey their parents, but secretly despise them in their heart. He may, you know, they may obey outwardly, but while, they, while they're carrying out what their orders are, what their mom and dad have asked them, he may, uh, you know, they may be talking about them, cursing or, or talking back under their breath. This is a wrong attitude. When your parents ask you to do something, you're supposed to be, you know, yes, you may not like it, but you don't sit there and grumble and gripe under your breath about them kids, right? The kids got quiet. But you're supposed to do it. Why? Because your parents have asked you to do it, right? And they're trying to teach you. Children should have a great respect for their parents. That they should, they should be careful not to talk back to their parents. That they should never run. Uh, they should never talk bad about their parents to their friends. We all know how it is. Yeah, I'd like to go and you know whatever. I'd like to do this by my mom. But my dad said I couldn't. You know, sometimes they can just be jerks. You don't do that. Because all you're learning at that time is to be able to talk behind somebody's back. And do you like it when somebody talks bad about you behind your back? No. It's kind of like that old golden rule. Do, as, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? They should respect their parents just as they would the Lord, even after that they uh, have grown and married. Because if they learn when they're younger to respect their parents, to honor their parents, to do those things, they will do it later on in life. Again, I said, you know, that we, obviously kids need to learn to respect their parents. They, they, they need to grow up with a natural respect. Kids, uh, kids who honor their parents have little trouble, little trouble in honoring the Lord. If the, a kid it will honor their parents, they have no problem honoring the Lord. 
and other, uh, and obviously other authority you know, figures and other people. A child, however, who will disrespect his parents will usually have little respect for others or other things. The fact is, you know, is plain to see as our world has become increasingly filled with more rude, insensitive, and self-centered people, haven't there? I mean, we're living in a day and age where many children are displaying clear disrespect for their parents, aren't they? You say, well, how? Well, back-talking, grumbling, disregarding their instruction, speaking disrespectfully, acting like a know-it-all, and refusing, obviously, to listen. You know, and there's obviously probably more. And others will do it through delinquency, crime, drugs, alcohol, sexual activity, abuse of parental or family property. There's a many ways that they'll do it. Why? Because they have no respect or honor for their parents. Because their parents maybe have not taught them this. Or have not showed them this. Showed them this. Ch- uh, adult children are often guilty of ignoring their uh, aging parents. I see this all the time. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong, you know, with you know the fact of parents sending, you know, uh, maybe their parent to like a nursing home so they can get adequate care. Care. So don't, you know, don't hear that. Well, pastors against nursing homes. I'm not. But how often do they go? How often, you know, how often, do, uh, you know, the ones that usually, you know, the ones that have high honor and respect for their parents visit their parents in the nursing home. The ones who could care less visit them eh, every so often. Nearly all children you know, uh, uh, fail when it comes to gleaning from the years of wisdom and life experience contained in the minds of their parents. Kids, when your parents tell you something, they're trying to share something with you, it is not always because, you know what, they're mad at you. Sometimes your parents will tell you things. Why? Because it's something that they learned and they don't want you to go through the same thing. Right? This is where your parents are supposed to say amen. Okay. Not every time somebody, you know, a parent corrects you, is, uh, if a, cor- a parent will correct you, it just does not mean that you've done something wrong, but it says, hey, you know what, I want to teach you something. Why? Because I want to help you in life. I want you to be the best kid you know, possible that you can. Let, 1 Timothy chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 4 and 8, says this. But if any widow have children or, or, uh, or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home. What does the word piety mean? Reverence, accompanied with affection, means that you respect them and you love them. You respect them by showing them that you love them. How do you, how do you show that you love them? Well, let's read the next part of it. It says, and to requite their parents. Well, what does that word requite? Because we don't necessarily use the word requite. It means to, to, to give back, to return, to repay. So if the parents have been showing them, you know, uh, you know, the parents show them how they're supposed to act, teach them all that, that they are to, to do what? They will repay them back with how they've, been, how they've been taught. That also goes the other way, doesn't it? That if they've been, you know, if the parents have been really disrespectful towards the kids, towards other people, the kids are going to be disrespectful towards other people and them, Right? For, this, uh, for that is good and acceptable before God. Verse 8, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So the Bible tells us that, you know what, that if they learn first to show respect and honor at home with love, they will return that. But if, you know what, if they're taught, you know what, to be angry, to, to be bitter, to, to talk bad about people, that's what they're going to return as well. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 20 says this, Whoso, uh, whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. What does that mean? You begin to start disrespecting and, and, and saying things about your parents. The Bible says what? His lamp shall be uh, put out in obscure darkness. You're going to be wandering in life, wondering what's going on, why you can't see clearly. Kids, when you disrespect or you dishonor your parents, that's what's going to happen. You're going to go, I don't understand why this is happening in my life or anything else. Why? Because your lamp has put out, been put out in darkness. But when you follow what your parents tell you to do, 
the inverse will be true that your lamp, you know what, is going to be is going to be lit, and you're going to be able to see clearly, you know, those things that you need to see. Proverbs chapter thirty verse seventeen says, "The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it." Now that is disgusting to think about. Think about what was just said. It said what the eye that mocks at his father and despises to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pluck it out. It's talking about the person's eye. And the young eagles shall eat it. So you have a raven that's going to pluck it out and the eagles are going to eat it. That's what it's, you know, So it's saying, you know what? When you do bad by your parents, bad things are going to happen to you. Exodus chapter 20, verse, uh, verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days might be long upon the land which the Lord thy God gives thee. Does that not now sound familiar with what we just read in Ephesians chapter 6? God wants us to know. He's saying it more than once. He's saying, you know what? He says it several times that way. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 3 says this. You shall fear every, uh, every man his mother and his father. I am the Lord your God. Now, I want to, you know, before I go any further, I want to tell you that there is, there is a conditional word. It says, notice the fact where it says, honor your parents, right? Honor, or sorry, obey your parents. But what is the next phrase? In the Lord. You know, obviously I'm telling you kids, you know, that you are to obey your parents, that you are to, that that obedience is obviously, con- uh, is conditioned by the behavior of the parents. But here's the thing. When your parents or someone else, like a teacher or, you know, government official, somebody tells you to do something that contradicts what the Bible says, then you don't do it. Don't use this because, you know, and say, well, you know what? The Bible never says that I'm supposed to go take out the trash. No, it, when it's in clear violation, when it goes against what God's word says, like it's something illegal, immoral, or it contradicts God's word. When it says, you know, when somebody says, you know what? You should go take that money because that's yours. And your parents are telling you to do that, or a teacher, or somebody's telling you, you know that's against God's word. The Bible says not to, not to steal. That's where you can say, no, I'm not going to do that because, you know what, that doesn't honor God. But obviously, there's a lot more, but, you know, um, obviously, parents, as you teach your, uh, your kids this, your kids will know and learn those things that they are, they are to do and also not to do. There's also a clarifying word. We're told in, in the latter part of, of verse 2 and, and 3 that obeying one's parents brings God's promise of blessing you know, to the child. Does it not? When a child honors his parents, he is honoring God. When you listen to what your parents tell you to do, you are honoring God as well. And you know what? The Bible says that when you do that, kids, that God's going to bless you for it. I was hoping to get a little bit more of an amen from like, you know, the adults in the room. Because that's a promise from God. That God says that when you honor your parents, that when you listen, that you respect them, that you obey them. The Bible says that, you know, that, that obviously the kids are going to be blessed, you know, because they've done it. Why? Because they are obeying, you know, uh, you, but they're also, when they do that, that they're obeying the Lord, that they're honoring the Lord as well. And because of that, they're going to get a blessing. So kids, when you listen to your parents, you're, you know, it means that you're also listening to God and you're obeying, you know, God. And then God says, you know what, I'm going to bless you for it. How many kids want, want blessing? How many kids want to be blessed? This is the way you do it. You obey what your parents tell you. You honor your parents. You respect your parents. That what they do and what they ask you to do, you do without grumbling or griping. You just go ahead and do it. I knew it would get quieter with the kids because I don't know. Because when I was a kid, I did not want to do that. Maybe I'm reaping what I sowed. Maybe that's what it is. You ever think about that sometimes? You go, you know what, why isn't this your person listening, this one, this one? Then you go, wait a second. I think I'm reaping what I sowed. Then you go, no, that can't be it. But it actually probably is that. God's promise, obviously, like I said, is to obedient children that they... You know, when they are obedient, they will enjoy an improved quality of life. 
What does it say? It says, that, they may be, uh, that it may be well with thee, with the kids, and an, impro- uh, in, an, impro- an improved quantity of life. And it says what? That thou may livest long on the earth. The Bible is clear in, the, uh, in this verse. The Lord will bless the child who honors his parents. When you honor your parents, when you obey your parents, you know what? The Bible says, you know what? That God's going to bless you because of it. I, mean, think it was, I don't know about you kids, but I still have parents, and I want that blessing. So what do I want to do? I want to honor my parents. I want to respect my parents. I want to do as the Bible says. Because you know what? Just like you kids, I'm a kid as well. An adult kid. But that's the reason why I still try to uh, honor and obey my parents, you know, right now. So, parents, how are you doing at honoring your parents? Do you want a blessing? It's not just for the, it's not just for the, you know, the small kids, it's for the adult kids as well. There's also a challenging word. Notice in verse 1 again, what does it say? In the Lord, for this is right. The word right speaks of righteousness. That statement reveals to the child why he should obey and honor his parents. Why? Because it is right. When a child honors and obeys his parents, he is doing that which is right in the sight of the Lord. In other words, it's, it, it tends towards you know, righteousness, that they are doing right, a righteous thing. Kids who are not told to obey and honor, they, it's a possibility that they, they, still might please the, you know, they still might please their parents, but you know the thing is that they're not pleasing the Lord, which I don't know how, I understand how that would happen. But we are to what? Honor our parents, we are to obey our parents. And we are to do this, you know, uh, we are to do this in an, uh, not in an effort to please everybody around, but it is in an effort to please the Lord. When we realize that when we do this, that we're pleasing the Lord and that we want to please the Lord, here's the thing. Kids, when you love the Lord and you are obeying the Lord and you are following the Lord, you know what's going to come naturally? You're going to obey your parents. They go hand in hand. When you honor your parents, when you respect them, uh, I'm sorry, when you honor the Lord and you respect the Lord and you do the things of the Lord because you love the Lord, you're going to do that to your parents. It's amazing how that happens. Now here's a message for the leaders. Verse 4, it says what? And ye fathers, provoke not your, uh, your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now I know the word fathers you know, uh, you know, is there, but you know what? That can refer to obviously what we're going to talk about is both parents in this context. Paul now turns his attention from the kids to the parents. Like, haven't we already heard enough about the parents? <laughs> well, you're here a little bit more. When Paul's talking about this, it was very uh, necessary, you know, for the society in which he had lived. Paul, in Paul's time, families were even more dysfunctional than they are today. You say, how is that possible? Well, it was not uncommon in some Greek and Roman cultures for men and women to have 20 marriages in their lifetime. You're like, man, that sounds like Hollywood. <laughs> Mutual love among the family, uh, members of the family were almost non-existent. In fact, most fathers ruled the home with an iron fist. Whatever dad says, went, and that's it. Don't care what you thought. You know what? If it goes against what I think. You know what? Guess who rules? He does. The ladies, didn't have, uh, ladies or kids had no opinion whatsoever. Their opinion was, yes, sir. I knew that would cause. In fact, like I said, uh, sorry, actually, history actually tells us that in that day, the father held the power of life and death over his family. What do I mean by that? Obviously, you know, this is not going to be found in, you know, uh, this is not going to be found in the Bible or anything else. I mean, we could see some things happening in there, but this is what it meant that they had the power of life and death. Number one was this. I, father could force his children out of the home at any time, at any age. 
Number two was this. And once he did that, he could sell them as slaves. He could enslave them, chain them, and force them to work in the fields. Now, kids, I want you to begin to sit there and think, is mom, is dad really that bad? Is grandma, is grandpa really that bad? Is my you know, aunt and uncle, are they really that bad? I have more. That's only the first three. He could take the law into his own hands and declare any sentence that he pleased. Think about that, that if he doesn't like the way you're acting, he could do whatever he wanted. Number five is this, that he could even put them to death and answer to no one for his actions. Infants were placed at their father's feet for him to inspect. If he picked the child up, it was accepted into the family and cared for. If he walked away, the child was simply disposed of. Babies like this who were healthy, were picked up, taken to a forum, or basically a market, and they were, uh, they were sold to be raised as slaves or prostitutes. This is what the Roman statesman Seneca, who lived in Rome while Paul was alive, or sorry, while Paul was in prison, wrote. He says, we slaughter a fierce ox, we strangle a mad dog, we plunge a knife into a sick cow, Children born weak or deformed, we drowned. This was the backdrop of what Paul is referring to and who he, the society that he's writing to. He's telling us, uh, he's telling his readers and us, obviously today, that there is no new. Uh, sorry, there is a new and better way to be a parent. That you don't do that. God says, do this. And obviously, you know what? We know that in our day and age that there are still wicked parents that abound. There's a reason why I don't watch the news all that much. Because there's a lot of bad news on the news. A lot of horrible things that you hear. But you know what? This saddened me even more. A recent study found that the primary reason most children end up in foster care is not due to divorce or death or finances, but simply disinterest on the part of the parents. They simply do not care for about the welfare of the child. That's the reason why you have so many kids in foster care nowadays. And that's not me saying that that's a study that they found, because you would think that the reason why most kids end up in foster care is because, you know, the family, you know parents got divorced, or, uh, you know, there was a death, or, you know, a fine. No, it's not that. It's because they simply don't care. I mean, think about how many kids are in foster care because of the fact that, you know, maybe mom had been going around sleeping around, said, you know what, I don't want this, you know, child that represents this person anymore. I don't love that person anymore, so I don't love the child, and they give it up. That angers me. Does that not anger you? Does that not break your heart as well? There's a cautioning word in here, and it's this, that we are told to provoke not your children to wrath. This phrase refers to a pattern of treatment that builds up resentment in the child. Parents are to avoid causing their children to brood in anger. When children are provoked to wrath, they, uh, they may even act this anger out and open hostility to parents and other authority figures. I think about teachers. Teachers in the school, there's so many times where teachers have to send kids. I mean, we would go over there, you know, uh, we have, I haven't been over there that much as far as like this year just because of my health. But we go over there and you talk to the counselors. You go talk to the principal and you hear how, how often kids are sent back and forth to the principal's office. Because they have no regard for an authority figure. And if, you, and we, the, if we looked at you know, the words, if we're translating words, the word provoke and wrath actually come from the same word. That when we provoke somebody, we're trying to get them to wrath. Paul you know, is saying, don't cause them 
to give just like they got, uh, you know, like they get. In other words, if we instill in them our negative traits, they will give the same things back to us. So if we install those, as I said earlier, those negative traits into the kid, what are we going to get back? It's kind of like the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. If we give them garbage all the time, that's what they're going to spew out back at us. If we give them love in the way that the Lord would have for us to do, then you know what? We're going to get love back, right? Like I said earlier, we reap what we sow. But kids don't sit there and say, well, you know, it's all my parents' fault because, you know what, you do have a free will. You do have a choice in how you act and behave. Right? Right, kids? So how does a parent provoke a child to wrath? There are actually many ways, and I'm just going to name a few. Speaking to a child in a harsh, degrading, or disrespectful way. You are to speak to your child in a manner that would build them up, not tear them down. You say, well, you know what? They did wrong, so I need to tell them. No, there's a way you can tell them when they've done something wrong on how to build them back up. Like, uh, you know, like a, you know, a point would be something along the lines of like, hey, you don't blow up the house. Because then now we have nowhere a place to live. I'm mean, obviously using like an outrageous example. Please, kids, don't blow up your house. Instead of, you know, you yelling at them and saying, you stupid kid, I cannot believe that you blew up our house. You can't call your, kid, you know, your, your children stupid, dumb, slob, or a klutz without reaping a detrimental effect on them. You know what? That's why oftentimes kids will sit there and say, you know what, I'm just stupid. Why? Because they've been told that their entire life. I shared the story about, uh, about my uncle. To this day, he thinks he's stupid, and he's one of the smartest guys I've ever met. You know why? Because he was told he was stupid when he was young. And he thinks that, you know, that that's how he is now, that he's dumb and stupid, because people would say that about him when he was younger. But he's honestly one of the smartest guys I know. Comes up with things. He just sits there and thinks about something and can do it. I'm like, I wish I had that ability. But he thinks he's dumb and stupid because of the fact of the way that he talks. He, he stutters. He stammers. Somebody said that he was dumb and stupid, and so that's what he thinks that he is. He's like, you know, the only thing I can be in life is a bartender because, you know what, at least I know how to do that. No, he can do a lot more, I'll tell you that. I mean, as far as fixing cars and coming up with different, I mean, just amazing, amazing mind. But yet he thinks he's stupid because that's what he was always told. Obviously, our actions will cause them to harbor resentment in their heart toward us for being, uh, you know, uh, toward us because of the fact that we, the way that we spoke to him. Our kids will, uh, you know, will listen how we speak to, uh, to others and know that they don't speak this way to other people. So if we speak one way to a person, they go, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to them that way. If I don't go over and talk to this person, don't call them stupid or anything else, they're like, I'm not going to do the same thing. The Bible even talks about, about this. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Who is he speaking of? Believers. You say, how do you know that? Be put away from you. He's speaking to the church. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. There is that, uh, there is that uh, speak, uh, uh, speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. We know that there's life and death in the power of the tongue, don't we? Colossians chapter 4, verse 6 says this, Let your speech, uh, speech be always, uh, always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Number two would be this, and how to provoke your child to wrath. Refusing to listen to your children. When you don't give them your undivided attention, you, under, you interrupt your kids, you, you, you put them off continually, you are demonstrating that you, are, you aren't interested in really hearing what they have to say. Eventually, they will give up trying to talk to you, which will automatically create a further distance in your relationship. When we do those things over and over and over again, eventually, it'll create that distance that kids have with you. 
I'm not talking about mileage. I'm talking about the fact that you, know, you have kids that, will, that won't talk to their parents to this day. That may be in their 50s or 60s and their parents are still, and they won't call them or talk to them. This is a verse that I often think about. James chapter 1, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. I always wanted to be super fast, you know, running when I was a kid. But you know what? Now I want to be swift to listen. I want to be able to hear what the kids are saying and what they're saying and, and what, they're, what they're trying to tell me. In pre- uh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse th- uh, 13 says this. It says, He that answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and a shame to, uh, to him. How many times has somebody, you know, uh, you know, like you tried to explain something and the person cuts you off and begins to, you know, say, you know what, this is what I'm going to say, and you know what, and then all of a sudden you say, well, this is, uh, you know, actually if you were to wait in, I could have told you that this is what I was trying to tell you. A couple of verses down in Proverbs chapter 18, this is verse 15, it says this, the heart of the prudent gets wisdom, or sorry, gets knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. How are you supposed to get knowledge or wisdom or anything else unless you're listening? In case you haven't figured it out, one of the reasons, and this is, I'll tell you, this is the reason why I talk fast a lot of times. is because of the fact that I wanted to get my opinion out and yet people would cut me off. You say, well, why do you do it while you preach? Because I got a lot to say. But that was one of the big reasons why, oftentimes, if I say something fast, I'll say something fast because of the fact that I feel like I'm going to get cut off. And that started at a young age. So if you, if, you want your, if you don't want your kids to end up like me, don't cut them off. Let them, you know, speak their peace. Number three is this, inconsistent discipline. Uh-oh. When your rules change with each new day or simply because you're not in the mood for it, children become resentful because they never know what you're going to do. One day, a certain action obviously is wrong, and the next day, it's like you could care less. Children need the stability of a consistent and faithful word. I think that's also the reason why some kids have a problem with reading God's word, because they're like, hey, well, maybe it'll change tomorrow. But we know God, you know, never changes. God wants you to be faithful just as he is. Malachi chapter 3, the first part of it says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay. For uh, For whatsoever is more than these comes of evil. In other words, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Matthew chapter 23, verse 3 says, All therefore, whatsoever uh, they bid you, uh, you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. In other words, they don't do what they're supposed to do. They say, I'm going to go do this, and then they don't go do it. He says, but you know what? If you say it, I want you to do it. If you say you're going to do it, do it. I would rather have a person tell me that they don't have time to or something else, whatever, than for a person to keep telling me that they're going to do it and never show up. Honestly, nothing infuriates me more when somebody does that. It says that they're going to do something, and then they come, well, I had to go do this, or this came up, or I had to go do, just tell me that you're going to do it. If you don't, you're going to tell me not to, yes, I'll probably be frustrated that you're not going to do it, but at least I know that you're not going to do it. As opposed to, hey, I'm expecting you to do this because you said you're going to do it, right? Give clear limits and boundaries. Kids need boundaries. Then be consistent uh, to the uh, to discipline their rebellion. If you say that this, that if they do this, this or this, that constitutes a spanking. Be consistent. Don't say, well, I don't really feel like it, or the kid ran away from me, or this, or this, or this. Go give them a spanking. If you say, you know what, well, you did this, 
That's good. I'm going to ground you from this. Then do that and ground them. I remember one, I remember the one time, this is you know, a funny story. My mom grounded me one time. I remember this specifically because most of the time I got instant discipline. She grounded me one time. I can't even remember what I did um, to get the grounding, but I know my mom said, you know, and my brother both, I think it was because we were jumping on the bed and we're not supposed to, so she says, you're grounded. When you get home, you're going to go up to your room until we get home and we tell you that you can come out. The problem was I was a little spoiled when I was a kid. I went to my room. I had a TV and I had a, a video game system. That wasn't really punishment. Oh, I got to go play video games all, all afternoon? Okay. That was the last grounding I ever got because my mom's like, you know what? It's either going to come from me you're going to get, you know, uh, you're going to get your uh, discipline from or your father. And always, the one that always was feared for me was wait until your father gets home. I'd hope she would forget. 95% of the time, she did not. Number four is this, over-discipline. Over-discipline. When you give your child a restriction for a month for some small infraction or a spanking when they only needed a verbal reproof. This obviously causes the child to become angry, uh, angry with you because they consider their, uh, these actions to be unfair. Ultimately, they will give up trying to please you because they become hardened toward you. Like I said, when you over-discipline, it's something, you know, like you make it a big deal out of not picking up a sock. After you told them to pick up the sock. You're like, I'm going to give you a whooping because you didn't pick up the sock. Does that really go with? It doesn't. Here's an example. Here's a biblical, you know, a, a biblical example. I was seeing this, you say, well, Pastor, this seems pretty harsh, but I'm just trying to tell you there are examples of this. Second Samuel, uh, Second Samuel chapter 14 talks about this, where David totally rejects his son Absalom and would have nothing to do with him for killing his brother Amnon. He said, well, my kids haven't even killed each other. They've gotten close. They wanted to kill each other, but they haven't killed each other yet. Then, you know, what, you know, what happens is that then David allowed Absalom to come back to Jerusalem but refused to see him for two years. And then Absalom later rebels against David and tried to take the kingdom from his father. We see all this going on because of the fact of over-discipline. Or the fact of somebody not wanting to discipline someone. Number five is this, lack of discipline. When you rarely reprove your children, verbally restrict them for their rebellion or spank them when necessary... They will wonder if you even care about what they do. Oftentimes, kids act out is because of the fact that they want to see if you care or if you're paying attention to them. When you just blow it off and say, you know what, whatever, the kids are like, oh, yep, they don't care. Mom, dad don't care. Sometimes they do it because they're like, you know what, some sort of attention, whether it's negative or not, they're like, even if I get negative attention, at least mom and dad are paying attention to me. And that's what we need to realize. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24 says this, He that spareth his, his rod hates his son, but he that loves him chastens him uh, betimes, or basically in due season. So in other words, it says, you know what, if you spare the rod, if you, don't, you spare the discipline, you don't ever discipline them, the Bible actually says that you hate them. Because it says, but he that loves him chastens him basically right when they do it or in due time. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. What does that mean? Sometimes kids need a little whooping. They need to drive that, you know, drive that foolishness out of their heart. Some of you, you know, maybe, th you know, maybe uh, trying to drive that one a little bit, you know, too much. But that's up to you. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. This is what we see in this generation so many times that, you know, kids are left home unattended. 
If you don't think that's possible, well, wait, school got out on Tuesday, so you should begin to see all the kids run, are running and roaming around town that have no parent at home, you know, uh, no one you know, making sure that they're uh, taken care of, which is really sad to see. Here's the other part of it. If they're left unattended and they're never getting disciplined, the children, children will not make the connection between sin and consequences in life. They need to realize that, hey, when there are consequences, you know, when I do something, when I do something wrong, there are consequences for my actions. Here's the example. I'm going to go back to, uh, to David and Absalom and Amnon. David never disciplined or punished Amnon for raping his sister, which resulted in Absalom's murder of his brother. All David did was get angry. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 13. Neither did David ever rebuke or discipline Adonijah, the brother of Absalom, who also caused him to rebel against David. If David would have just you know, disciplined his kids and, and showed them, maybe all this stuff never happens. And I would like to remind you, say, man, David's a horrible person. The Bible says that he's also a, he was a man after God's own heart. So what does that mean? That you can be a believer and still have bad children. Number six, constant fault finding and punishment without praise or re, uh, and reward. When discipline is needed in your child's life, obviously you gotta you you must deliver in a fair and controlled manner. When you need to discipline, you need to do it. But you also need to appraise and reward, and equally important, if you are to be fair to your child. If your child does something great, say, you know what, that's awesome, great job, you did, you did a great job doing this. Thank you so much for helping mom do this. Or thank you, dad, you, know, thank your, uh, thank you uh, for helping your dad do this. When you give your child a well done, sometimes that is all the war, a reward that they need. They don't always need sugar as a reward. Because you have some kids that will sit there and negotiate, well, how much do I get? Kids need to learn that you know, not every single time are you going to get money or you're going to get some sort of you know, a sugary treat, but you can just say, you know, hey, you did a great job. And most of the time, when you tell them great job or you know, they did something awesome, that does more for them than the sugar or the money. God, you know what? And God uses a reward system in order to motivate his children to obey. Do you know that? God uses, uh, God uses rewards to motivate us as his children to obey. You say, well, uh, I, I don't know about that. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Heaviness in the heart of, of man makes it stoop, but a good work, word makes it glad. Matthew chapter 6, verse 4 says, Then thy, uh, thine alms uh, may be in secret, and thy, fa- uh, thy father which sees in secret himself shall do what? Reward thee openly. God does that all throughout, the, you know, all throughout. I mean, think about it. I mean, he rewards us for something that we don't deserve. You say, well, how's that? He gives us heaven. He says, if you just believe on me and you're obedient, like, he says, when you believe on people, I believe in God. No, when, you're, when you truly have believed on the Lord, he rewards you with heaven. Number seven, physical abuse. These are all obviously things that you shouldn't do. If you punch, kick, shove, slap, or beat your child, you are actually breaking their spirit and provoking them to resentment and wrath towards you. How many times have you ever seen a kid all of a sudden that they're just like, you know what, they start fighting back their parents because their parents are doing this, and what does that kid end up doing? They start beating their children. It's like a, it's, it keeps going on, keeps going on. Why? Because the thing is, is that, well, this is how my dad treated me. This is how my mom treated me. I'm going to treat my kids the same way. Until somebody breaks that cycle of doing that. You cannot justify your actions with a proverb that commands you to beat, you know, with a rod. We just did that one, right? Just so you know, if you want to look at the actual proper meaning of that word beat with a rod, it means to strike lightly. See, we've changed the words, you know, uh, to suit our own needs at times. It means to, uh, you know, to lightly strike. Discipline should be motivated by love, done in a respectful manner, and always when you are controlled. Do not, if you are super angry at your child, 
you might want to take about, you know, a good, you know, a, a, maybe a minute or two, like in the bedroom before you come out and just let them know, like, I'm coming, you know, like, you can let them know, I'm coming back when I calm down a little bit. And then you're going to get your punishment. So that way they know what's coming. But you don't do it out of anger because the thing is that when you do something out of anger, you're, you most likely will take it to a level that you never intended it on taking it. And you can't take that back once you've done it. This is how God you know, corrects us. Pre, uh, pro, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, or disciplines, and uh, scourges every son whom he receives. The Bible even says that, you know what, that if the Lord is not chastening or disciplining you, that you are basically not his child. He actually you know, refers to the child as a bastard that is not really, their ch- uh, not really his child. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, even as a child, the son in whom he delights. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The Bible talks about the fact that God, that he loves those, or that he chastens those, he disciplines those that he loves. Number eight, refusing to humble yourself and ask your child for forgiveness. So many times parents will sit there and say, well, you know what? I don't need to apologize to my child. They should just know. You know what that is? That's called pride. That's flat out pride. If you can't admit that you're wrong to your own child, then how's your child going to ever know that it's okay for them to admit that they're wrong? They will look at you and say, well, you don't ever apologize, so why do I have to apologize? What you need to do is show them the, the, the importance of reconciliation and that this is how you should act you know, to your future family, to teach their kids. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his, uh, his fault between thee and him alone. And if, uh, and if he shall hear thee, then thou hast gained, uh, you know, gained a brother. In other words, you know what? You have a problem with somebody? You know what? And you know that you need to go apologize? Go apologize. I heard too, far too many people, you know what? This is the way that you need to man up if you're a guy, is learn how to apologize when you're wrong. Because it takes a bigger man to apologize than for one to sit there and hold a grudge and say, I'm not going to do it. I mean, how old are you? You're basically throwing a temper tantrum as a doll and saying, I'm not going to do it. Surprise, you don't go, I mean... You start throwing, I'm not going to do it. And you start throwing a little temper tantrum or what? There's a counseling word in here as well. And I'm, uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. Like I said, we, we, I went through all the negative on there. But I want to end this with, on the positive. Is this. Parents, you are to enrich your child. You are to enrich your, your, your kids. That you are to bring them up, as the Bible says. To nurture them towards you know, a maturity. And, that, you know, and what that is, is, is the fact that, parents, you need to invest your time in your kids and don't give up. Your kids need your time, not your money, not your house, not your, all the stuff that you whatever. They need your time. According to a reason why I say this is according to a recent study, the average father in America spends a whopping 3.7 seconds with his children every single day. You say, how is that possible? Because they'll come home, say hi, and they'll go right to their den, study, watch TV, go do something else. I got to go work on the truck. I got to go do this, got to do whatever. I pray that there's no fathers in here like that. I pray that, you know, and I believe that that's true because I see all the dads going, like, what, how, 3.7? I mean, that that's like, you know, astonishing to them that that's even, you know, that, that that's even, a, I mean, think about it, that that's on average. So some parents, you know, some fathers don't spend any time with their kids. Parents, number two, parents are to educate their children. 
And the Bible says to nurture. In other words, that is the whole education of the child, that they are to take that into consideration, that that refers to the daily discipline and uh, of verbal instruction in the ways of life and the ways of the Lord. If you don't teach your kids about the Lord, then, then who will? Because the world's going to teach them everything that they, w- they want them to know. Number three, parents are to encourage their children. The word, uh, you know, you know, admon- you know, admonition, excuse me, means to counsel, encourage, and discipline. It refers to the act of guiding your children toward maturity. We have far too many kids that are 18 years old, and they're still acting like kids when they get older. They're still throwing temper tantrums like they did when they were a kid. This is the reason why I think that you have so much you know, road rage on the road. Somebody did this to me, so I'm going to do the same thing. I see far too many kids doing that. I mean, oh, sorry, adults. I mean, same word. Adult children will sit there and, you hear what I'm saying? Adult children will sit there and have the attitude and, and throw, like I've seen adults throw better tenter, uh, temper tantrums than kids. In front of their kids, I'm like, all you're doing is teaching your child to throw a temper tantrum better. I remember uh, there was a youth pastor friend of mine who exemplified this. He was playing a video game, which I was like, okay, well, you're playing video games and you're an adult. You maybe, yeah. But anyways, he was over there, and all of a sudden, he, he, he got mad because something on the game, like he kept on getting the same spot, kept on messing up, kept on messing up, kept doing the same thing over. And all of a sudden, he just kind of jokingly went like, you know, whatever, and he was just mad. He was like, oh, I can't win, I ran with it. Well, this. And he looked over, and his daughter was like, and he looked at the, and all of a sudden he began to think. He goes, "I just taught my daughter how to throw a temper tantrum." <laughs> Number four, parents, you need to evangelize your kids. You need to evangelize your kids. All this nurture and admonition is to be of the Lord, but we are to steep them in the Word of God. Not our opinions. Not our preferences. Not our prejudices. Not our political affiliation. Not any of that but in the Word of God. Because the Word of God is all that matters. We need to teach, we need to teach our children to believe what the Bible says and not sit there. And the thing is, is that we, when we do that, we also need to change ourselves. Because if we teach what the Bible says and we're teaching and then we go on and we do something different than what the Bible says, they're getting mixed messages. Like I said, we need to train them in the things of the Lord that then when they grow up and live their lives, that they will glorify and honor God in their own lives. And I know that this is, I close with this, is I know that this is one of those kind of like, oh, me sermons, like, oh, pastor, why did you, you know, are you stepping on my toes? Like I said, I read this one and I knew, because I was reading it and I was having, I was like, okay, is the problem with what I'm reading or is the problem with me? And I looked at it and said, you know, the problem is with me. I, I, I have to, you know, I have to look at myself in the mirror just like every single person. Because I can guarantee there's probably some area in this sermon that each parent, grandparent, you know, relative or whatever has said, you say, you know what, that I'm falling, I'm failing in this part. I, you know, and like I said, you know, you can hear this kind of preaching and, and it hits us right where we live, doesn't it? But that's good, isn't it? That's good. That means that the Lord is speaking to your heart and helping you to grow. Because we are to grow in the Lord, right? We're going to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. So what do we do with this sermon? Well, first I want to talk to the kids. Kids, I want you to understand this, that God loves you and has a plan for your life. In his time, he will make that plan known to you. But in the meantime, let me encourage you to obey your parents. Don't make me stop my sermon again. Somebody was trying to help you, and you didn't listen to them. And I believe it was an adult. But like I said, in the meantime, 
let me encourage you to obey and honor your parents. They love you and simply obviously want the best for you. You know what? If you get in line with them and do as they tell you, things are going to go well for you, aren't they? You're not going to be getting in trouble if you're following what your parents say. If you haven't been as, as obedient and respectful as you should have been, you might want to come to the altar here in a moment and ask God to forgive you and then go back, to, back and ask mom and dad to forgive you too. The second is this. If you're a parent who, ha, you know, who has made some mistakes, and obviously, we, like I said, who hasn't in this room? Who hasn't made a mistake? You need to come and, and make it right. You may even need to go to your kids and apologize. Howard Hendricks said this, children are not looking for perfect parents, but they are looking for honest parents. And honest, progressing parents is a highly, infe- a highly infectious person. Kids want your honesty. They want you to sit there and say, well, you know what? Mom and dad realize that they're not perfect. Third is this, that there are maybe some, uh, some parents here who have tried their best, but their kids are, not, you know, are out, of the will of, uh, out of the will of God today. My question to you is why not bring them why, why, why not bring them up before the Lord once more and trust God to bring them home? Remember as I said earlier, remember Proverbs 22, 6 is, is a principle and not a promise that if you train up a child in the way that they should go, that when they're old, they will not depart from it, right? You left them in, the, you know, in their hand, bring them up you know, uh, to the Lord again, and stop beating yourself up over your children. Your kids make their own decisions. And lastly, that there may be some here today that, you know, that are not saved. Maybe some of those that are listening online. Jesus loves you, and he died for you on the cross to provide a way of salvation. That if you come, the Bible says that he will save your soul, that he will give you eternal life. So for the next few moments, there's not going to be any music playing or anything else. But as I, as I said earlier, kids, if you have not listened to your parents, you've been disrespectful to your parents, you have not honored your, your parents, I ask that you would come to the altar this morning and ask God to forgive you. But not just asking God to forgive you, but I want you after that to go back to your parents and ask them for forgiveness and say, you know what, I'm sorry that I, did not, I was not honoring to you. I, I, I did not listen to you. And second, if you're a parent that obviously has made mistakes, you may need, need to come down and ask the Lord for forgiveness and then go back to your kids and ask them for forgiveness as well. And like I said, if, you've, if you're uh, you know, older, uh, older here this morning, but your kids, you know, they're out of the will of God this morning, I ask that you would come forward and bring them up before the Lord again. And pray that the Lord, you know, will save them, that the Lord will bring them back. And obviously the last one, if you're not saved, come forward and we want to pray for you that you would be saved today. So for this, this morning as 